Whereas like when I finished school at 18 and I told people I wasn't going to go to college, like I, I had applied for a mechanical engineering course and I got accepted into it and I rejected it. And, uh, you know, when I told people that they're all just like, what are you doing? Like, you can't keep like at the time I was working in a bike shop was before I was doing the courier stuff. And they're like, you can't just work. It. You can't do that forever. Like, you don't want to now start your career and stuff. And I was like, no, like I, I college wasn't for me. School wasn't for me anyway. But I kind of saw it as like an apprenticeship, like I'll do three, four years grafting, spending my own money, like having no money. Um, and then hopefully at the end of it, I'll have a job, which like a pro contract, basically. Hello, my name is Morgan and welcome back to the Content Collectors Derailed podcast. This week, I'm talking to Greg Callahan. Um, Greg is one of the world's top enduro mountain bike racers. He has won EWSs before, uh, and he was a super interesting guy to talk to. We talked a lot about his time as a privateer, how he managed to get onto a pro team, uh, and also some of the sacrifices he made while being a privateer, which is people kind of talk about in terms of um, athletes, you know, how they actually got there and the sacrifices they made. But we don't often talk about uh, the consequences of these sacrifices. You know, we talk about how hard athletes work, um, but we don't talk about the price that they pay. Um, and it was great to talk to Greg about some of the issues. I mean, he had a really, um, you know, he got himself onto a team and he achieved amazing things um, while being a privateer. Uh, but he still had to make sacrifices. Uh, so that's what we talk about. Um, we also talk about a bunch of other things, his t- 2020 season, um, his EWS wins in Ireland, um, and a bunch of other stuff. I really enjoy talking to Greg. I really think you're going to enjoy watching it. If you do, please like, comment, and subscribe. It would mean the world to us. Otherwise, uh, we're going to jump in now to my conversation with Greg. Thank you for watching. Okay, Greg, how are you? Yeah, good, good, all good. How's the... Uh, How's the Irish winter going? Uh, cold and wet. Pretty similar to the Scottish winter. Much the same. Really. <laughs> has, it been as, has it been as terrible in Ireland as, it be, as it's been in Scotland? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's been pretty the great. The last few weeks especially, it's gone extra wet and cold. Um, we're due some snow this week, so hopefully it'll be the good kind of snow that you can play in and not just the, the icy, sleep. sludgy, crappy kind of snow yeah. you kind of do it with. Yeah, we've had, a lot, we've had a lot of that. How's the? How are you finding this... Um, second lockdown uh that is the third lockdown for us actually um oh really yes we're pretty used to it now (laughs) um yeah like to be honest it's it's not too bad for me like i can't complain too much um like i'm in a house there's four of us in the house here so i'm still seeing people uh i've got a home gym a pretty sweet home gym at home so nice that's good i can still train as normal and then i've got loads of trails within my five kilometer radius radius so yeah. like not that much has changed really. I just just can't see people obviously. Um so yeah, I'm just kinda used to it now. Like you just kinda get into a routine and you get your head down and you just kinda make do with what you have. So uh Yeah. yeah just how did you find the morning. how did you find the first lockdown last year? Because that was quite a change of pace for I mean it was a change of pace obviously for everyone, but for for mm. sort of international athletes obviously. I mean uh it was probably one of the first summers I'd imagine you had in Ireland. Uh, for quite some time how, how did you enjoy it yeah exactly it was um yeah huge change of pace like originally it was like really kind of demoralizing when all the races got cancelled and lockdown came and the doom and gloom of covid and everything that was going on it was just like you know there was quite a while there it was like jesus like what are we what are we doing like what are we training for what's what's the point and all that kind of stuff so i kind of just park training for a while um, because we, like you know it was pretty clear we weren't going to be racing anytime soon so training kind of got parked built some trails uh just kind of became a normal person like wasn't too worried about training or eating and they could have a few drinks and not feel guilty about it which after a while after i got over that initial couple of weeks it was actually really nice to just be like that for a change because you know so many years racing kind of everything you do has like this you know, every decision you make has something attached to it. There's a knock-on totally, effect. Totally, yeah, yeah. It'll... Was it quite hard? Because it was, I mean, I, when I, I like raced quite obsessively for probably like six or seven years. And and when I stopped, it was actually, I mean, I stopped sort of 
uh, kind of for good, which was quite different. But I'd imagine there was because when you're, you know, training and racing and stuff, it's all, as you say, you're just only you're thinking about like your day is good if you if you did your training and, you, you know, you're just yeah. gearing towards that next race. And so it's really strange when that's kind of taken when, when that like when you lose that. Was it quite hard for you, mm-hmm. like for uh, in that initial phase? Yeah, yeah, just definitely. That, that, like, so clear focus. Like that initially when, um, like when races initially got cancelled, I remember like Keelan Grant was down in my house because he, he came down for a few days training and we heard everything was cancelled and we like drove to the trails that day just after hearing the news and we just sat in the van and we were just like, oh, it's raining, what's the point? Like there's no races and we were just totally like just fully wind was out of the sails and we actually mm-hmm. didn't bother going riding. We were just like, screw it, we'll just go get some lunch and just chill out <laughs> and then uh yeah. yeah so like there was there was probably two three weeks where it was just kind of like that you just didn't know what to do and then you kind of realize that you're like nah like i really enjoy exercise and i enjoy training <laughs> and all that kind of i like was like no i need this like it's what makes me happy is exercising and feeling healthy and fit so uh then it kind of changed from training for racing to just training because i wanted to and it actually in the long run became a really good thing because it made me realize that this doesn't have to be something that I just do to get better at racing. It's something that I would do anyway. And oh, then it yeah. kind of gave me like a different perspective on it, a different outlook on it. And, um, you know, I think since then, like I've enjoyed my training much more because it having the reason taken away and then still doing it was, uh, so you're doing it for yourself as opposed to just, you know, f- you know, for a race or something. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, not just because the training plan said, so you're doing it because you want yeah, to do yeah. it. Um, so yeah, it was actually good, and like the weather in that first lockdown was mint. It was amazing. Mm. So um, yeah, like it, it it got better. Definitely, it got better once that initial kind of shock was wore off. It did get better. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I'm asking everyone that question because I'm just this second one in the winter. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> bleak. <laughs> it's yeah, so it's bleak. Different. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to to spring at least some some nice warm weather every uh mm. yeah every sick so i want to talk to you about sorry have they told you guys when they might open things up again uh i'm kind of the most brutal thing is just not being able to drive to go riding or i just got a surfboard and stuff i was really looking forward oh. to getting into surfing uh, and mm. then i and then as soon as I did, it was just like oh we're not even, we're not technically allowed to drive more than five miles i'm sure I'm, i think you're probably the same right yeah five kilometers yeah yeah something like that so that's and then just not being able to see your friends and stuff but it's not, yeah. not being able to go and uh just drive to go riding and stuff is probably the the hardest thing this time you know especially yeah. with the with the poor weather it's not like and then not being able to see everyone and stuff but yeah. be over one day yeah hopefully maybe in march march april we'll, uh mm. at least be able to go there and, and ride and stuff again yeah um yeah, so I wanted to to find out a little bit just about your um, your background and your and your life. I know you've you've kind of touched on it, and I listened to your your downtime podcast. Uh, I know you sort of touched on it in there, um, but yeah, it'd be good to go into a little bit more depth with it actually. Yeah. So, how did you? When did you start riding, and and how did you get into it? Um. Yeah. Like. Like I was. I was pretty much born on a bike. <laughs> um, like my dad and all my uncles and my family have always ridden motorbikes. Like my granddad, my granny, like it, it goes way back. So as soon as I was born, I was at motorbike trials and motorbike enduros with my dad and my uncles and stuff. So it was only a matter of time before I got on a bike. Um, and I think I was four. I got my first motorbike, a PW50. And then that blew up. And didn't get fixed so it was kind of then i had a while without one and then when i was eight i got a trials bike and started riding in trials and i took to that really well and i really really enjoyed it and um, it was something i did like every week you know i'd be out a couple of times a week and then um when i was around 15 i because the thing with the trials was because it's a motorbike i could only go when my dad could bring me so mm. that was only so often it might be twice a week or whatever where it's like i'd come home from school and just wanted to ride a bike like it's all i wanted to do so then I went to some jumps near my house and just met some lads there who were riding and, you know, rode the jumps for a good bit. And then uh, they were like, oh, we we go mountain biking as well. Like, you should come up with us. We're going up that hill there, Ticknock, which is still my local trails. And I uh, went up with them and just loved it straight away. Like, I was on a piece of crap rally bike. And, uh, yeah, I just loved it straight away. So then I think, yeah, when I was about 15, like, I went straight to racing because I feel like back then... 
you know, there wasn't like social media and there wasn't all this other, other ways of getting like recognition or approval or whatever it mm. is in writing. It was just you raced and that was the only measure you had or the only mm. way you'd like get to ride the best tracks or get to meet people or whatever. It was just these events were like, it was just always a given to me that if there's a race on, I'd go to it. Mm. So I started racing at 15, racing downhill. And uh, yeah, from then on, as I say, anytime there's been a racer event, I've, I've been there. Um, and That's yeah, cool. at the time, like enduro didn't really exist. There wasn't on my radar yeah. anyway. Um, but once it did in Ireland start up, like I did the Mega Avalanche and stuff a couple of times. Um, so once yeah. Niall Davis set up the Irish Enduro Series in like 2012, I think. Um, yeah, I was just like, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. It's what I kind of did anyway. I just couldn't race it because there wasn't any races. And uh, yeah, went straight in and then just built from there, really. Did you find, so you, you were riding motor trials bikes from a super young age. Mm. Uh, and the first motorbike did you say was that a, that was like a normal kind of dirt bike not a tri- not a trials bike yeah yeah it was a pre 50 so it was like tiny little motocross bike you see like tiny little kids because I'd imagine that would be a real good you know like a lot of the world's best like downhill riders like Gwen or Danny Hart uh, they did motocross and BMX you know and it seems like yeah. downhill is like a sort of uh, is a mixture of those two things almost uh, yeah. was I take it there must have been a good like base the Dirt bike, the, the motor trials coming into into mountain biking, probably more so for enduro actually than than downhill. Mm. I'd imagine trials is, is more useful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, like I got my first bike was technically a motocross bike, but like my dad was, he was always afraid of me getting into motocross because I guess like motocross is so expensive and there's like it, it's just crazy how much money you need to be successful at motocross. Um, and then the injuries that come with it and stuff. Like he raced motorbikes and motorbike enduro. And he'd had some pretty big injuries over the years. So I think he didn't really want to put me into that where you're just mm. setting yourself up for a lot of debt and a lot of injuries. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, yeah. Yeah. He always kind of like, trials was always bigger in our family too. So like it was kind of, he kind of always nudged me towards trials. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I feel like when I got on the mountain bike, like I took to it really quickly because mm. I just had like trials is essentially all the basics of riding a bike just like you're really focusing on them. So all like your balance, your coordination, your timing, your even just understanding where the grip is in getting up something or going down something or the line choice and all those kind of things. So mm. once once I got on a mountain bike, all that stuff that maybe would take someone time to learn just came natural to me. Mm. So um, yeah, it definitely was a really big base, good, good base That's skill good. level that I had. Um, and then, yeah, like it, there's definitely times now in enduro when that comes into you know, comes into my advantage because, uh, yeah, compared to downhill, I guess enduro is generally more slow and technical. And, you know, I could, there's a good bit of riding the front wheel around all the switchbacks and stuff. So, uh, yeah, totally. That, that's basically trials. Um, yeah. <laughs> and what was the, what was the scene like in Ireland when you, when you, uh, first started? In mountain biking. Mountain biking. Yeah. Was there quite uh, a big yeah, scene around where you grew up? Like it seemed big to me at the time. Cause like, Trials is a really small sport, really. Um, so mountain biking, like when I was going to mountain bike races and there was 300 riders, I was like, whoa, this is mad. So <laughs> many <huge>. people. <laughs> Which is still like, it's great numbers. Um, the scene was really strong then. And it's, it was a lot of, it was a real community thing. Like it was a lot of core people in it and everyone knew everyone. And, you know, there were certain people who were kind of higher up the ranks that would look after the people below and that kind of thing. So it was really cool. Like it was kind of, yeah, real community vibe which uh you mm. know i really i took to and a couple of people took me under their wing and that helped me a lot as well um so yeah it, it was definitely strong like it's a lot stronger now um as it is in a lot yeah. of countries I think. but uh yeah i think for at the time it, it was definitely a strong scene and so uh, my next question is just do you think it, how do you think it's changed like wh- how do you think it's changed since uh, you first got into it because it seems like certainly I've noticed just even around, we always used to, uh, I grew up, I'm at my parents' house at the moment, I grew up around here, and we always used to go up to this hill just near the near the house, and it seems like there's so many more people, especially with this pandemic, but there's loads of, yeah. there's just so many people with mountain bikes, you know, it's it's, it, it's definitely a growing growing sport. Um, how do you, So how do you think it's changed over over near you? Yeah, it's it's crazy here, like it's, it just boomed so much. Um, like I think a great example is like my local hill, Ticknock. Um, and like when I was growing up, you had like the Bone Shaker was the one track, which is just a rocky walking path, it's pretty much in a straight line. And like that was the main track you'd go up in session and ride and like you'd be getting grief from the walkers and you weren't really meant to be there. And it was kind of like, 
you know, it was a real underground sport at the time. And now, like, that same hill has a trail centre on one side of the hill. Loads of, like, unofficial trails that are, open, you know, they're kind of allowed to be there. Um, and the place is packed at the weekends, like, just bikes everywhere. And then on the back side of that hill, there's a full-blown bike park, the Gap Bike Park, um, mm-hmm. which is an old golf course that closed down and reopened as a bike park. So it's, like, gone from this one trail that was, you weren't really allowed to ride it, to a trail centre and a bike park on the one hill and they're both so busy. So uh, I really feel like it's become almost like a mainstream sport now. Um, and mm. as you say, like the, the pandemics, you know, amplified that like you now even more. So it's, uh, totally. yeah, it's pretty cool to see. It's amazing to see just so many people out enjoying bikes. Absolutely. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. How do you think it, uh, do you think it differs much from, from the UK like scene at all, or, uh, if at all? Um, yeah, hard to say. Like, I think, we always had this thing where we kind of felt we were maybe three to five years behind the UK in terms of development, like trail centers and stuff. Like say you guys had Glen Tress and then a few years later we got our first trail center and it's kind of, we're maybe just a few steps behind. Um, I haven't actually been to the UK to ride in quite a few years, so I haven't seen it as much. Um, mm-hmm. Like I know in terms of enduro, like you guys don't have, so I think there maybe is gonna be, but there's not so much of a national series anymore. Um, whereas like here we've got a really strong national race series um, so yeah I think it's, it's probably kind of hard to com- I'm probably not in a, I don't know enough about the current UK scene to compare but uh, yeah I think we're definitely closer than we used to be um, like we've we've definitely made some real good progress the last few years totally yeah do you think that um, I mean with the, with those would have had a too big an impact but those EWS's in Ireland were some of the biggest sort of crowds and stuff that they had at all do you think that did much to Mm. like bring showcase mountain biking in in the area yeah yeah definitely um like yeah every year that event got bigger and then like every year it was on national news and on national tv and it just created so much noise about the sport and like since then Mm. i've met so many people who said they've gotten into mountain biking since that like they might have just gone along and watched just out of interest or they might have just seen it on tv or whatever and it kind of either got them into mountain biking or got them back into it because they might have stopped 10 years ago and just mm. kind of forgotten about it. Um, yeah, like I think just just for putting mountain biking on the map, it, de- it definitely had a huge effect and, you know, we're, we're maybe still seeing the positive effect of that. Totally. You must be quite a, a local celebrity around all these uh, all these trail centres and stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's cool. Like it's like that, like again, local hill TikTok. Like when I go up there, it's... For like most rides i go up someone will kind of stop me and say hello and ask how training's going or how racing's going or why am i going to next or whatever and yeah it's yeah. really cool like that kind of stuff like it it really spurs me on to see that like i could be out on a training ride and in between some filthy intervals and then someone will stop you and say that you're just like that oh, this is it's pretty cool it's definitely cool like i think ireland's a great country for supporting their own totally and, yeah yeah you know we're a small country we don't have that much sporting success so when they see someone doing well i think we're really good at getting behind them and uh yeah, I've definitely been really fortunate to be able to, you know, be on the end of that and feel it. Absolutely, as well. And you see as well the sort of bigger side to what you're doing, which is because you will have had an impact yeah. in terms of getting more people out riding. The fact that there's an Irish guy winning uh, winning EWS and stuff is bound to inspire Irish folk to get out and ride. Uh, so it must be quite, yeah, just fulfilling to, to, be, to be out and knowing that you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and to see... Like even the range of people, you know, you've grown men coming up to you and saying those things, or you've, you know, the little kids who are just buzzing to see you, or buzzing to ride with you, or whatever. And like, yeah, it's, it's just so cool to just see people excited about it and to think, like you say, like if I have inspired a few people to get on a bike or race the bike or maybe have more of a go at, at racing, then you know that's that's just the coolest thing, you know. That's a, oh, a absolutely thing. totally yeah. So you say you were about fifteen when you started racing mountain bikes. Yeah. And it was downhill at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was downhill. So, and then I'd, I'd, if there was an XC race on, I'd, I'd go and do it as well. So I kind of always did a bit of a bit of both. And like looking back, the riding I would have done between races was always enduro riding. It just didn't have a name. <laughs> mm. um, like I'd, I'd usually just ride my downhill bike mainly at the races. Um, so yeah, I guess and, I was enduro before I knew I was. <laughs> yeah yeah so as soon as enduro came along then you knew that it was like oh that that's that suits me better or like that's what i want to do more than more than downhill yeah yeah definitely like i i've just always enjoyed 
riding smaller travel bikes and going out and exploring, you know, just riding a few different hills in a day or different tracks in a day. I've always liked that side of it. So, uh, yeah, the second it came along, I, I did the first race and it went quite well. And, uh, you know, that, that and how long before. then, how long, cause enduro, it seemed like is a, it's not recent, but it definitely was like when I started racing or even riding, when I started riding, which doesn't seem like that long ago, um, although it's, it's growing further, <laughs> we're getting further from it. Um, <laughs> it was just, you know, it was, as you say, like, I mean, people had, you race downhill. Like, if you were interested in like technical side or going fast, you would race downhill um, in the cross country and you either had like a downhill bike or a cross country bike. And it seemed like enduro was something that kind of came along um, almost towards like, I, I suppose it was probably around like 2011, 2000, well, that's when it gets started getting big. When, like, when did you do your first mm-hmm. enduro race? Um, it was around then, like it was, it was a year before the first EBS because I remember the first Irish race, uh, Niall Davis, the organizer, he actually invited over like Jerome Clements, Nico Lau, uh, Al Stock, Joe Barnes, Gary Forrest, Gary Forrest came and raced it and he knocked himself out in practice and then didn't, <laughs> and didn't race. And then actually maybe it was Hutch there. Hutchins might have been there as well, actually, now that I think of it. Uh, was that when, because a lot, those guys you mentioned, like, Joe was racing downhill. Was this, they came over to a race, an enduro race in Ireland. Yeah. yeah that yeah. was like, that they, was the first enduro race that you, that you, you competed at. The first, mm, pretty much, I think. Yeah, no, I think it was, I'd done the Mega Avalanche. Um, but that's like, it's kind of, that's kind of its own format. Mm. Um, but yeah, so all, all these big dogs came over for that first enduro. I think it was like 2011 or so. It was the year before the first EWS. Um, yeah. And then I did a few more in Europe that year. And then the next year, the EWS became a thing. And uh, yeah, I was just like, right, I'm going, I'm going all in for this. So cool. uh, yeah. Yeah, so they must have come over because they made the switch. Like Joe, anyway, made the switch kind of, he was one of the first downhill riders to, to switch to enduro, I, I believe. And yeah, at the yeah. time it was like, at the time, I guess there wasn't actually that many, like there wasn't a UK race there wasn't like there wasn't all this series so they must have gone over to this race in ireland because it was one of the few that was going the enduro races yeah, that was yeah. actually, that was actually i happening. think it was like at the time that series was one of the best because um like joe joe liam and the boys they came over and actually raced the full series that year and it was really cool because like the the level was just insane like tracy mosey came over to one Rennie wield ever came over to one like it was just it was like international racing at home it was mad and uh, i remember me and joe actually had a real good battle that year I th- I'm pretty sure he came to the ball. He might have missed one. I'm not sure. But it came down to, we were like pretty much tied in the series coming into the last race. And then uh, we like, were, yeah, it was just tight race that day. It was actually in the same venue the EWS ended up being. And I remember one of the, I like had a real good day. And then towards the end, my chain came off. And uh, I was, sna- I was raging. I had to like run ah. this fire. I was so angry. <laughs> and then it turns out we've been like real close all day and it was a sad like i don't know i think joe probably would have gotten me anyway but uh yeah it was mad it was pretty You're cool like looking back just how tight the battles were even back then That's cool. and how did your enduro results compare to your the results so how old were you how old were you at that race like when at that first enduro race Ooh, uh i was about 20 yeah about, about 19 mm. 20 or so and how did those enduro results compare to the results you were getting in in downhill um, no, I, uh, I was definitely better at enduro straight away. Um, like the thing with downhill was whenever I, like, there's no real downhill tracks in Ireland or near me anyway. Um, so it was always really hard to get downhill bike time and get fast, you know, time riding fast, rough tracks. Whereas for enduro, like we've got heaps of really good enduro tracks. So it was kind of easy for me to train at a good level here. Mm. Um, so whenever I went to international downhill races, I was just blown away by the speed and the roughness. And I was just... I was just a small fish in a big pond. Whereas with the enduro stuff, I felt like I could go away and feel a bit more comfortable and it suited kind of my strong points in my riding, I suppose. Um, so yeah, straight away, my results were better. Like that first race, all the international guys were at, I think I came like fifth or something. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a million miles away. And that was, that was probably my best results to date, you know, compared to any of my downhill results or anything. So yeah, it was kind of, it was pretty clear that it was something that, suited me better and how old were you like when you thought um like okay i'm gonna commit to trying to make a career out of out of mountain biking uh i think it was the end of 
to, so it was the end that there was that first year of the Irish races, and then towards the end of that year, I got a deal with Dirt Norco through Ben Reid. He was running that team at the time. Yeah, I remember that. And then so that first EWS year, I rode for that team and traveled to Europe. Did like two big trips out to Europe and did most of the full EWS. And like I was training, but I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Like I was just riding my bike loads and eating crap, and you know I was just a, a twenty-year-old kid just doing whatever. And then kind of towards the end of that year, the results started getting better and better. And I kind of realized, like, I'm, I'm just putting myself at a disadvantage by not preparing properly, not training properly. So um, I remember, actually, I wrote Chris Kilmurray, who's still my coach. I wrote him an email. And, like, I'd ridden with him a bit that year. I'd raced with him a bit that year. And I'd, I already knew him. And uh, kind of had my eye on potentially getting him as a coach. And I just wrote, wrote him an email. Just, and the title was Make Me Deadly. <laughs> I was just saying like, oh, that's sick. I want to be deadly at Enduro. Will you make me deadly? And then uh yeah, yeah we've been working together ever since. So uh, yeah, we do yeah, we do talk cool. about how it's funny that that was what started it. <laughs> uh, yeah. It like from there on it it de I definitely improved as a result yeah. of all that training and then it kind of changed my mentality to be like right you're good enough to have a proper crack at this so let's start kind of sacrificing everything and you know, training mm -hmm. the days you don't want to train and really putting your head down into it. Was that something like before, you know, you made that decision and you, you were working with uh, with Chris Kamara and stuff, like in the years before then, was it in the back of your mind, like always? Like when you, you know, because certainly for me, when I started racing, like I always wanted to, originally it was like I wanted to just, like I loved riding my bike and I just wanted to make a career from riding my bike. So racing was just seemed to me like a means to an end. Like it was like, oh, if I want to just do that, like I can race and that's the way like I can make it happen. And so even, even though like I learned to sort of really enjoy the racing and stuff, but it was always in the back of my mind and it was only like you get, so I would get the, the odd result where I was like, oh yeah, maybe I could actually make that happen. But was that like, even, you know, early before those years, was it something that you thought about like sort of more, but more like in the back of your mind, like I would like to make a career out of this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, as I say, like, I've been around bikes my whole life, and whatever sport I was doing, I'd always look to the top guys of the world, like Dougie Lampkin in trials, uh, or Stefan Everts in motocross, whoever was winning, and I'd be like, geez, I'd love to be at that level. And I always said, I want to be world champion, I want to be professional, but I never really, I guess, I don't know, did I not believe it in myself, but I never, like, committed to it. So I was never mm -hmm. like, right, I'm actually going to do everything it takes to make this happen. I just, like, I was... I was training and I was traveling to race and I was doing all these things, but I wasn't fully committed. And I guess at the time, maybe I thought I was, but looking back, I wasn't at all. Um, and I think that year of racing the EWS and having good results and, you know, competing with guys who were full-time professionals, it really opened my eyes to like, oh, okay, I actually am capable of, you know, making a thing out of this. And it, I wasn't as so far off these guys. And, it was pretty clear that, you know, I was losing out. I think a big telltale sign that I knew, like, right, I need to do something was um, Adam Craig, the, like, ex-cross-country pro. He raced in Giro for Giant for a few years. And it was a stage in the EWS in Les Duel. And he, there was a pretty, like, it was like a three-minute climb or something real steep. It was horrendous. And I like, thought I was doing real well up this climb, and he came past me as if I was standing still. <laughs> oh, no. And, oh, my God. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I was just like, like right, yeah. well, I am just I'm pedaling upstream here. Like, it's, I need to do something about this. <laughs> yeah. So what was the difference then? You said, um, you know, you thought you were committed before, and then you started working with Chris Kamari, uh, and then you became, it was it like, then that was when you became fully committed. What was the difference in the in the commitment levels? Um, <clears throat> yeah, like I, there was a, a few years then after that where I just did nothing else. Like I was working a full-time job as a courier driver, like a UPS driver. And like it then changed from maybe getting up in the morning and doing a bit of a ride or maybe doing a gym session in the evening or <clears throat> actually I wasn't even doing gym before that. Um, but it was just riding doing decent rides and then it changed to like getting up before work and doing a proper ride on the bike and then going doing your day's work coming home going to the gym doing a gym session and doing that you know three or four days of the working five day week and then at the weekend you'd be going out and doing your specific sessions as well and doing all the sprints and everything and i think when you step the training up that much you kind of have to 
follow with the diet and the sleep and everything. Like you've no energy to then go to the pub after or you've no money either. That was a thing as well. Like it was <laughs> a full time and you're committing all your time and energy to it. But at the same time, you have to commit all your money to getting yourself to the races. So, um, yeah, like it definitely changed my life a lot. Like I went from just being a normal 18, 19 year old to like, right, I'm fully committed to biking and everything else is kind of secondary to that. It just became a primary mm -hmm. focus. And uh, yeah, like it, it definitely works. Like the results changed straight away. Like there was each year after that, there was kind of drastic improvements in my results. So then when you can see it working, you kind of commit a bit more to it and you kind of, that motivates you to kind of go harder at it. So uh, yeah, it just, it's just built and built from there really. So how long were you doing, like just working all the time? We're just working and training all the time. How long were you, were you doing that for? Ooh, uh, it was up until the end of, so 2015 was my first year pro. So until Christmas 2014, I was working. Um, so yeah, it was probably, I did the season on Dirt Norco and then I did the season on New Proof as a, like privateer full time, with a full time job. And then mm. it was the following year I joined, I started with Cube. So then I could finally just so focus on only riding my bike. Yeah, it worked out. Yeah, it's funny. I did something similar, but without the uh, success. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I was like working all the time, training all the time, like really kind of committed and stuff. But um, a bit younger, probably. Like I, I when I left, I sort of did it when I left school, like at sort of sixteen, seventeen, and then just like had two or three years when like that's all I was doing. Um, mm. And it was actually for me. It was. It ended up being. I just had like. I just wasn't having any fun, and then isolated myself. You know, and uh, it just wasn't. It was just a little weirdo, basically. I, I was just wondering how much of a. You only did it for I guess two, maybe three years, and you were seeing your results like improve each year. So obviously, you're, mm. you know, you you could see it working. But what you know, aside from the racing success, did it have? Did it take much of a toll on just your general kind of like well being? Yeah, like that's like, yeah, you said, like, as you say that you isolate yourself and that's, it's something that's not really mentioned a lot, but it's, it's a big part of it. Like I, I kind of had no choice. And I guess you did as well. Like you kind of have no choice, but to isolate yourself. Um, like I definitely lost touch with a lot of my friends during that time. Um, just because, you know, we were just on different paths and different, different lifestyles. Like I'm trying to go to bed early and get up early and train and stuff. Whereas they want to just be normal people and go out partying or just hanging out or whatever it is um so yeah like it's pretty hard to not end up like that and i think had i not have had the success like how long would i have kept just plugging away at that but you know the fact it was a constant positive trend for me really made it a lot easier for for me to just stay motivated and stay stay at it um and yeah it kind of it even even the way things did pan out well it still took a while to rebuild kind of those relationships and stuff that I had kind of I'm isolated kind of myself from. Totally. Yeah. And was that something good? Like, yeah, for me, that was when I sort of like stopped racing and it wasn't so much like, I didn't really make a decision. It just like, I didn't care anymore. And then that, that was it. Sort of decision made. Uh, but then trying <laughs> to like rebuild uh, my, <laughs> trying to like rebuild my life and stuff was actually, uh, was quite, was quite challenging. Was it when you actually got on the contract and then you kind of had time again to like, um, to, to be like okay like <laughs> I, I can have a life again was that it was a bit of a did that take a bit of, a, of an adjustment yeah yeah definitely and like you know because you're trying to like rebuild the relationships with people you haven't seen in so long and they're kind of like oh we haven't heard from you in the last yeah. few years like now you just want to talk to us whatever so it's you know you kind of have to overcome that kind of initial hurdle um but yeah I, I guess it just took a bit of time like and in the end, it all it all worked out well. That you know, I've I've still got you know my core group of friends are the same core group of friends I had when I was when I started riding at fifteen, sixteen, and it it came good in the end. It just, it just took a bit of time, um, and you know I think that's a lot of the things that people don't see. Like there's there's so many you get so many messages and stuff. People saying like, how do you make a pro and how do you how do you make a pro? Basically, is the main root mm. of it, um, and that's the stuff that people don't realize how much you've actually sacrificed. Like there's, you know, you can talk about how hard you have to train and the money you have to spend on racing and stuff, but it's the day to day, 
you know, making that decision to not go out on Friday night with your friends or not see them in the evening and get up early the next day and go train. And yeah. they're really the choices that make the difference because, you know, it's it's hard to, it's very hard to find a balance between the two and see the success in it. Um, totally. So I guess, yeah, like the, the more you put into the racing and training side of things, the more you'll see back out of it. So, uh, you know, trying to mix the two is, is well, you're kind of compromising yourself. So uh, exactly, it's definitely hard. Like that's, that's my situation anyway. That's how it was for me. And, you know, there's probably other people out there where maybe their core group of friends are more into the training side and so it doesn't affect them that much. And like maybe it makes them closer. But um, yeah, I know in my case, it was definitely, uh, we were just on different kind of lifestyles at the time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's interesting. Is I mean, you obviously were you know making big improvements every year, but what's so tough about trying to make it in sport is there is, I guess, working with someone like Chris Kamari, Pump One Athletic and stuff, gives you more of a blueprint. But like, mm. it's not like you know if you want to be a doctor or whatever, like you know, like okay, I pass these exams, like read these textbooks or whatever, and then they can make this happen. Whereas trying to make a career in sport is like there is, you know, it's all seems it's so much trial and error, and each trial is like a year you know like each off season is a whole you know year of your life a whole other year like working away and stuff um it's a real it's a it's a hard thing to do yeah 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 big time and like and that's it like it's like you say like there's a there's a path in other careers so like the done thing is go to school finish that go to college finish that get a job and you're constantly working your way up this ladder that's you know it's laid out in front of you whereas yeah. like when i finished school at 18 and i told people I wasn't going to go to college like I I had applied for a mechanical engineering course and I got accepted into it and I rejected it and uh you know when I told people that they're all just like what are you doing like you can't keep like at the time I was working in a bike shop was before I was doing the courier stuff and they're like you can't just work you can't do that forever like you don't want to now start your career and stuff and I was like no like I, I college wasn't for me school wasn't for me anyway but I kind of saw it as like an apprenticeship like I'll do three, four years grafting, spending my own money, like having no money. Um, and then hopefully at the end of it, I'll have a job, which like a pro contract basically. Um, you know, and I think I'd kind of made a deal with myself that if I got to like 23 and it wasn't working out, then I'd probably start looking at other things. Um, luckily I turned pro at 23, so I didn't have to do that. <laughs> it's but, funny um, actually, that's exactly, that's exactly what I did uh, when I left school. I was like, right, I'm going to give this three years. Um, yeah. And even though, you know, I didn't end up with a pro contract at the end, it's like calling it an apprenticeship is actually, a, is a, is I like a lot because even if without the pro contract at the end, you do learn uh, like the amount of applicable skills I learned in that time of just obsessively yeah. sort of thinking about racing that I've applied to, you know, the things I'm doing now, a, a kind of different career um, mm. is like invaluable, you know, like r regardless of if anyone's sort of thinking like, you know, should I do this or, or whatever. Um, you'll learn a lot in that time whether you actually whether you do get the contract at the end of it or or yeah, you don't and that's it yeah. and like I feel, you know you, you'll never regret taking a chance like that as well like I remember back then when I was coming up to finishing school and I was still undecided about what to do I went for a ride with um, Mick Burton a trials rider from here and he's multiple time Irish trial champion and like he was a god to me at the time because the stuff he could do in a trials bike and we went for a ride and he, I was kind of saying to him that I wasn't sure what to do. And he was like, you know, he kind of had a chance. He could have made it at trials, but he never really made the big jump to fully commit and go international with it. And he kind of said like he, you know, he kind of wished he did. Um, and he was saying to me, like, just take the chance. Like, you won't regret it. You know, you'll get. And he was kind of the one that made me think like, right, okay, yeah. Like, this, this is something worth giving a go. Mm. And like, had I gotten to 23 and, it didn't work out. I would have been like, wow, that was an amazing few years. Totally. Like, yeah, exactly. Absolutely amazing memories. And as you say, you learn so many life skills and life lessons from it, you know, and then at 23, you're still, you're still plenty young to, you know, start your next life of whatever career you decide. It's yeah. Totally I think actually just learning, um, just doing something you love, just you like, you learn everything through, working hard to pursue something you love. Like the skills yeah. are the same. You just apply them to, you can apply, you apply exactly the same skills to whatever else. And like just learning to love something or just to be passionate about something is like, is, uh, it's, yeah. and it's such a gift. It's, it's hard to even, 
uh, sum up regard you know regardless of whatever success you have at the races, just loving something as much as and being willing to work as hard at, at that thing is is such a such a gift. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 class. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it works pretty well for you. <laughs> you get on a team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then the, was it the following year you win the EWS in Ireland yeah yeah as my, like as I like, say it was, a, it was a steep progress curve <laughs> so steep like I like <laughs> what was that like I mean <laughs> just that must have been your just the most like the your wildest dreams just coming uh, true it was ridiculous and like that was like that race was at the like pretty much the start of that season so like I finished the 2014 season and then my contract didn't kick in to the 1st of January. So I like finished that season, went home, became a UPS driver again, worked <laughs> half the winter and then did the first race in Rotorua, the first US that year. And I was just like, this is mad. I'm on a pro team. I've been to all these team camps and photo shoots and stuff. It's just a different world. And then I got 11th in Rotorua and like I'd been running top 10 all day and then ended up 11th. And I was like, oh, that's class. And I was nearly in the top 10. Like, so happy with that and then there was a big gap from there until the irish race that irish race was the second one and like in that time so many people were just like jesus like imagine you got a top five or imagine you got a podium <laughs> and like oh that'd be crazy and like in my head i was like you know quietly i was like i know i could win like i'd, I'd seen enough potential in stage times and stuff to know that at home i could i could probably be up there but i was like I'm, i don't want to say this out loud <laughs> yeah yeah exactly, <laughs> and I, yeah and I was still like, I was, I was kind of with them. I was like, yeah, geez, imagine I did get a podium. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just mental. Like I just, I don't think anyone really expected it to go, to go as well as it did. Like it was just nuts. The whole day was nuts. <laughs> yeah. It just must've been so special because like, the, the, the crowds were so big as well. And as you say, like Irish, it seems like the, you know, the Irish really do a good job of, of supporting, of supporting their own athletes and stuff. And, I just can't even, I just can't imagine how, how incredible that, that must have been for you. It was mad. And it was, it was, a, it was such a funny day. Like, cause I like, like with Kamari, like my coach, like leading up to, it, we were just like, what are we going to do about the pressure of it and the excitement of it and everything? I thought about Sony, I was like, will I just ride all day with headphones and just block everyone out? I was like, nah, like you can't do that. Like it's, it's too special to just ignore. Um, but I did kind of like, I didn't check results all day and it was as if there was this like unwritten rule on the hill to just not tell Greg how he was doing. Like it was no one, no one blew it all. No one came up and told me how I was doing it. But you could just see on people's face, like marshals on the liaisons would just be like, so how's it going? <laughs> like, Ooh, and you could just see them, like, something was happening. And every stage, cause like the crowd kind of followed the top 30 or whatever riders. So the crowd was on each stage and every stage, it just got louder and louder and more ridiculous. And in my head, I was like, right, this is, it's obviously going pretty well. Like I'm riding well. I knew, I knew I was riding well. Um, but I was like, oh, maybe I'm on the podium. Like, because again, like people's expectations, I didn't know if they'd be going crazy for a top five or a podium. And, uh, yeah, like I knew nothing about it. And I had to have known, I probably wouldn't have taken so many risks on the last stage because <laughs> I had like a pretty wild line on the last stage and I was like like in my head I was like right just do it it could cost you the race or it could win you the race I don't know so I did it and like rode my heart out on that last stage and uh, I ended up I think winning that last stage and I crossed the line and my dad told me he was like you were like 12 seconds up before this stage to Sam and I was like Sam, Sa Sam who? <laughs> I was like, what? Because like Sam Hill was racing, but he hadn't really done any enduro before, so he like wasn't even. On yeah, of the course, that was the first. Sam that Hill. was the first one that he won, wasn't it? Or is he? He didn't. He didn't win it, but he, it was the first one that he like he raced. Did right? well. Yeah, because yeah, he done well, Rotorua. Yeah. He did Rotorua, and like he didn't really have a great day. I think. Right. Like he yeah, had yeah. problems and stuff, so like I didn't really see him as a contender. I guess. Um, foolish me because you'd never count that man out. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, he's a beast, he was like, yeah, yeah. You're, up on, you're up on Sam Hill and I was just like what is going on this is madness <sighs> and, that's uh, so cool yeah yeah turns out so then for the it's really cool the way they did it so they instead of us just rolling to the finish in whatever order they um, they like got us to line up at the top of the field 
coming into the finish areas, they waited so all the crowd could move from the last stage into the field. And then as each rider rolled down the field, the commentator introduced them and they'd like cross the timing thing and their time would pop up on the screen. And uh, I rolled down the field and before my time even popped up, the place just went nuts. <laughs> it turns uh -huh. out like everyone was going crazy, but no one actually knew if I'd even won it. Like I could have totally blown in the last stage, but no one really knew and no one really cared because they were just so buzzing from the day. Yeah, and, amazing. Uh, it, was a yeah. Good, it was good weather as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really good actually. It was... Yeah, it was funny because every team just came with vans full of mud tires and I didn't get yeah. to use them. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's so cool. Yeah, um, it was crazy. And then, so, uh, the, the next year as well, you, you won it twice, right? Yeah, yeah, two in a row. So, you, you mentioned in the Downtown podcast that like, the first time you um, you didn't really take as much of it in and then the, the, at the next mm. one, you decided, like, okay, I'm going to make sure like I, I take everything in. Um did you manage to yeah, do that in the, yeah. in the, at the second one? Yeah, exactly. Because that first one, like, I didn't know what was happening all day and I didn't really want to know. So I was just focused on myself, really. And then, um, yeah, the second year, I kind of took a bit more of it in. The crowds are bigger. The crowds are more excited. It was a real different vibe because it was like, well, you've won it once, you're going to win it again, kind of thing. And mm. obviously in racing, like, nothing's a given at all. Um, so I definitely felt more pressure that time and the race was a lot closer. Mm. Um but yeah, I didn't know so much during the day, but uh, yeah, like I definitely, I probably have more memories from that day because I was taking it all in. Whereas the first year, like I just, I was just like emotionally closed off all day. So I didn't, even when like I found out I'd won and stuff, it didn't really hit home because I was just so like focused on my riding and not letting the outside affect me. Um, How... Did yeah. that? Do you think that helped, or was it? Did it make it harder, like trying to be emotionally open, you know, during a race? The second time. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It. It kind of like. I think in the long, in actually the way things panned out, it probably did help, because the like I think it was the second stage. I didn't ride that well. I think I had a bit of a crash on the second stage, and then I was able to kind of let the crowd and all the people around just like lift me back up again. Whereas I think if I had blocked all that out, I wouldn't have let that happen. And I maybe could have got into this like negative spiral and start riding tight or riding too, trying too hard. Um, whereas I think the positivity of everyone on the hill, and that was the thing, like no one was telling me you have to win or we're going to hate you. There was none of that. Like everyone just was happy to see me even in a position to be fighting for a win. And they were happy to see me doing well. So it was all just, positive energy it wasn't really pressure um so i think i was kind of able to feed off that and enjoy the day and uh yeah I'm, de I'm definitely glad like i had kind of you know it was it happened for three years so i could kind of learn from that first year and be like right now this is really special like take it in and even like like that second year like i wore a a, a camera for the last few stages because i was just so like this is mad like i want to i want to have these memories kind of thing totally and, right. yeah I'm so, I'm so glad i did <laughs> That's awesome. So how, how do you think that differs from how do you usually race? I'd imagine it's generally easier to just be more closed, focus on your process, your race, and not try and take too much in, you know, of what else is going on. Is that is that how you usually approach a race? Yeah, yeah, like definitely. Yeah, usually, usually just try to focus on the process of, you know, getting from A to B on bike as fast as possible and just take each turn as it comes, each stage as it comes, and just try to focus on that alone um it's obviously harder now as the sport gets bigger there's kind of more interviews between stages and more of that kind of stuff so it's hard to you can't really just fully close yourself off mm. um yeah basically um is that something that uh it's a yeah that must be a whole different thing dealing with like you know having to be like interviewed and stuff you know midway through a, a race is that something that's happening more often now yeah, yeah, it's, it's mad because like um, you like you finish a stage and like straight away you're interviewed and it's it's a funny one because like a lot of the time you don't really remember everything that happens in a stage until you kind of reflect back on it, or sometimes you might not even remember because you get into that magical zone that mm. you hear about, um, and like sometimes you'll get interviewed and you'll talk and you'll be like, yeah, yeah, really good stage, like yeah, really happy, road smooth, and the camera will go down and you're right away and you'll be like, no, wait a minute, I. <laughs> a terrible state <laughs> yeah, and you can't remember what actually happened 
so I always think that must be so hard. It must be so hard, you know, like sports like tennis or uh, football or something, especially tennis because it's an individual sport. Like, and people have just like, what's it like, you know, for Andy Murray to go out and just kind of suck for two hours <laughs> and then have to do like yeah. an hour and a half of just explaining <laughs> like everything that went <laughs> wrong. And it must be, it must add such an extra layer of <laughs> sort of misery onto, onto like a uh, defeat. And I suppose it might yeah, make us. Yeah, and that, that's it. Like it. sometimes you'll be having a bad day, and like you might come down with a mechanical or puncture or whatever it is, and like everyone's asking you about it, and you have to talk about the problem you've just had, and you're like, you want to just kind of go somewhere quiet, but um, you know that that's it's just part of the sport. It's part of the modern modern sports. Like everything's so heavily documented, um, and it's it's it, like I definitely wouldn't see it as a bad thing because the more coverage we get, the better. Really, it's mm. just uh, yeah, it's just a byproduct of that. Is there anything on that note? Is there anything you miss about uh, being a privateer, or like not having maybe the pressure or the or the contracts you know that you, that you have now? Um, like I'm pretty fortunate that, like especially with Da Vinci, like last year for example, like I I just went to Europe in my van, and it was me and my mechanic because we kind of had a slim down team because of COVID, because like Keegan Wright didn't he couldn't travel from New Zealand, um. And like it wasn't that different at all. Like I just went around racing in my van um, with mechanic. Like there was obviously the benefits of having a mechanic there who's there to look after me, and then the other team members who kind of came for some of the races. Um, so like there's not a whole. I've kind of I think I've come full circle now. I've done the like I've come back to a bit of the van life kind of stuff and enjoying it and getting to between the races you can drive to whatever bike park you want and do a week's riding there or do your training there. Um, so like I've never strayed too far from the van. I've always loved, nice. loved the simplicity of the privateer life. So I've always tried to keep, totally. keep it there. Yeah. See, now you get the best of both worlds. That really is the, the life. I mean, yeah. to be, to be getting paid to live in a van and ride your bike. That's, that's, yeah, it's insane. And it's, <laughs> it's actually a nice van. It's like the vans I had when I was racing were not like I built one, at the start and oh my god it was terrible like there, there wasn't a straight <laughs> cut on a single piece of wood in that van it was awful <laughs> whereas now i've actually built one and been able to like spend a bit of money and make it nice <laughs> nice yeah that's sick yeah. um i wanted to talk to you about your your red bull sponsorship um yeah. obviously in action sports it's it's one of the most it's kind of the coolest sponsor it's certainly it's, it's like so recognizable across you know it crosses all sports and stuff and anyone wearing a red mm. bull helmet or red bull hat is like you know that is top of their game in in some action sport um how big a deal was it for you getting getting that deal yeah it was With red bull. it's crazy like as you say like it's you know whenever i was growing up watching any kind of sport like dougie lampkin was my hero as a child he wore a red bull helmet and like any sports I'd look to or any heroes you'd have, they probably were wearing a Red Bull helmet. Um, so then when things started happening that I might be getting one, it was just like, this, like what? Is this is actually happening. Um, yeah, like it's such a like exclusive club, I suppose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> being, being able to wear wear the logo. Um, yeah, it came about in 2017. Um, and basically they contacted me and were like, yeah, we, we want to talk. We want to, we want to have you on board. Um, and yeah, from then on, it's just been, it's been incredible. Like the support they give and the opportunities they open, like there's so many layers to Red Bull, like whether it's the getting to go to Austria and doing, going to like the diagnostic center and doing all that training side of stuff to, you know, have a benefit on your, your sport and your racing and your training and everything to the, the cool stuff like i got to sit in an f1 car and i got to drive a formula one formula four car like things like that like you know things that you just wouldn't yeah. have otherwise like opportunities that i wouldn't really have presented to me it's it's crazy mm. and how does the because it seems like red bull once they sponsor an athlete it's kind of a contract that like they're in it for the long run always um how does the how does that contract differ? Like, obviously, you don't have to go into any details or anything, but just how does it differ from uh, your other other sponsors? Yeah, basically, like, it, it's, you know, it's in terms of contracts and stuff, it's another sponsor, but then in terms of the relationship and the benefits of it and how much they help 
help me. Yeah, it seems like, um, I think that's more of what I meant. It's just, it seems like they're very yeah, supportive. You know, like you get, uh, it just seems like they're very supportive over, over their athletes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I think they understand that, you know, they want to help their athletes to be better. Um, whether it's to be, you know, to create awesome content or just to have a better chance at succeeding in their sport. So, you know, like the performance center they have in Austria is, it's incredible and like the staff they have there and the level of knowledge they can provide and the insight into your body basically they can provide you is just incredible and even the fact they have that there shows how committed they are to helping people achieve their potential really and uh, you know I think that's it's crazy when you when you look at them over the years like how many careers have they helped and how many sports have they helped to create massive events like Rebel Rampage and mm. Rebel Hardline, all these things that push sports forward further and how many athletes they've taken from a young age and, you know, developed their career and steered them in the right direction. It's just, it's incredible, like how much positive effect. It is mad. I'm always, I'm always so confused at Red Bull. It seems like they must spend more money than they, <laughs> than they make. It's like they sponsor <laughs> everything. They've got a, a Formula One team. They send people up into space. They, they, they just do all this cool, cool stuff. It's, it's like, they support so many athletes. It's funny. Like, and they just sell it, you know, they just sell drinks. <laughs> so, yeah. They, it's a funny business. Well, it's cool. Um, oh, so the 2020 season, uh, obviously super, a bit of a strange like season um mm. how did you how did you find it um yeah like yeah what it what it like i don't think it needs to be said that it was a mad year mm. <laughs> um <laughs> in terms of the race season like it was it was probably short and sweet really like we had uh three ews i did four races total i got a french race in before um yeah it was an interesting one for sure like it was just mad because even like we finally got to Zermatt for the first EWS and it was like, right, brilliant, bit of normality. We're racing again. Let's get stuck in. And then the weather just went to crap. And it like we finally the or EWS had finally managed to organize a race and everything was going smoothly on the COVID front. And then the weather just threw a massive spanner in it. Um and yeah, it was definitely made it a weird vibe because even like I remember on race day it was snowing at the top of the hill and like we were hanging around all morning and stages were getting cancelled and we didn't know if we were going to race like it was kind of back and forth whether or not there'd even be a race um and eventually like we did two stages and it was just so wet and so cold like it was so hard to just ride well and like you couldn't like i remember going in stage one and i just couldn't feel my fingers so i yeah, didn't know if worse, I, was, I didn't know if i was breaking or not <laughs> yeah I went to make sure i just did loads of breaking and went slow <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, that was like it was a weird race because it was, you know, you were you when you're training and when you're dreaming a race and you dream of like attacking hard and putting your everything mm -hmm. into it, but you just felt like you couldn't do that because of the way the conditions were. So it was a weird one. Um, and then the next two in Pietro Liger and Finale Liger were they were good. They were really good. Um, Pietra, the weather kind of played a bit of a. A bit of havoc there as well like i think it was stage three the longest stage of the race it rained for the top whatever riders and made it really slick and slippy and um, so i lost a bit of time there but i was kind of i was just having an okay day it wasn't like exceptional um and then finale i think i just had a i can't actually off the top of my head remember the results i think i was around i think i was around 15th for each race anyway um it was just kind of i just kind of finished the season being like that was okay it wasn't wasn't great wasn't bad it was just okay um yeah and i think it was just kind of the year that it was it was hard to just jump back into that race mentality and you know go full attack and you could see the guys who had managed to get some a few races in before that you know it really paid off because they'd kind of built that speed up whereas in any normal year like you usually start the year kind of slower like everyone would and then things kind of build up the more you race the more you race you kind of you you build back up to that speed so it was kind of hard to try to get to that point straight away when some people were already there mm. um so you know given the circumstances i was pretty happy but uh yeah i definitely didn't go home and you know celebrate too hard <laughs> <over those results. laughs> in terms of like learning from last season have you treated it differently you mentioned you know working with um 
your coach after like you know the lear- like how you know the learnings after each race and how you're going to approach the next one how are you have you treated last year differently from from other years yeah definitely definitely um i think like as i said earlier like the whole lockdown and that kind of chance to have a break kind of taught me a lot about enjoying my training and it made me kind of realize that I respond well to having goals to chase and having training that's enjoyable and you know it makes me want to do it and it, you know not just doing it because I have to because the training plan says it and I think that you know like I think I was in really good shape last year and I had really good momentum in my training so I think like in terms of my preparation it was really good I just didn't have that extra kind of couple percent of just pure bike speed um like when I went to the Red Bull Performance Center at the end of the year, like all my tests were better than they were in 2017 when I was last there. And um, so like, I think that, you know, realizing that about enjoying my training has definitely been a positive thing. And I feel like, you know, going forward, it's going to be really good and it's going to make it easier for me to put myself in a good position coming into the races. So, um, mm. you know, it, you might we might look back and I could see COVID as a, well, not COVID, but the lockdowns and 2020 has a positive kind of chance to reset and start again with a fresh outlook, which is it's mm. pretty cool. You know, I think, uh, you know, as much negativity has come from it, I think there's actually quite a few people that are probably coming out of this whole thing with a better outlook and a better lifestyle. Yeah. Maybe Certainly a lot. Well, we've all learned something, <laughs> you know, in, in, yeah. in the last yeah. year. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So you've learned that you enjoy all sides of your, of your training. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and to keep it that way as well, you know, like I I started racing and I started riding bikes because I enjoyed it. Um, and I wouldn't say I'd, I'd lost the love of the renting, but I maybe wasn't enjoying it as much as I could be. And it's kind of reminded me to kind of bring it back to that and keep things simple and just, just enjoy training and riding my bike because that's what gets the best results at the end of the day. So, yeah, that's really cool. Um, what's been the, the biggest challenge for you since becoming... So I keep on moving that camera. Um, since becoming pro, or just over the last, you know, five, four or five years. Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I guess something like maybe managing, not right now because that much would happen, but managing the travel and different trips and stuff. Like it's pretty easy to say yes to a lot of stuff and end up doing a lot of different like filming trips or things with dealers or you know training camps and like going to nice places to ride or doing different races between the EWS and um, there's definitely a lot more opportunities for that kind of stuff and I think you kind of have to be careful I found I have to be careful about doing too much because it's great flying around the world and doing all these different things but there's a lot to be said for routine and when you're at home when you're at home and you're just in a routine you're just working away um that that's when a lot of progress is made. So I think trying to find the balance between, you know, living this life that you want to live with just jet setting and riding all these amazing places and keeping your eye on the goal and keeping, uh, keeping focused. That's interesting. I think, um, can you hear me? Yeah. I just lost you froze there for yeah, a second. Yeah. It's going to be patchy there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, keep it focused. Is, has been one of the challenges mm, yeah uh, cool well I think we're almost we're either past that we're probably past the hour but I've just got uh, just a couple more a couple more questions for you um, yeah, the first is what do you think you'll do when you retire from from enduro racing oh tricky like it's something it comes into my head now and again and I'm just like, oh, it's like I've been so lucky to have this life that it's hard to think of life beyond. Like what would I want to do? Like what would fulfill me and make me as happy as mm. doing what I'm doing now? Um, I'd love to do something maybe with like a bike shop or something like that to try, uh, you know, get people on bikes and stay involved because yeah, you know, like it's it's pretty cool just hanging out in a bike shop and chatting to people about bikes and riding bikes and racing totally, bikes and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, and then like going back in terms of history, like my granny and granddad had a shop called Callahan Motorcycles, um, which 
like my dad worked in, a lot of my uncles and stuff worked in. So it'd be cool to, you know, maybe continue that on in a different form with Callahan Cycles. Cool. Callahan mm-hmm. Mountain Bikes or Callahan Cycles. Yeah, that should go. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, who knows? You know, hopefully uh, some sort of opportunity or something will come along that I can stay in the industry. Like I think definitely if I, if I was to retire, I wouldn't just disappear. I'd still, you know, I'd still race at home. I'd still ride my bike every weekend. Um, and I'd still want to be involved in bikes. Um, yeah, like my whole life, I've just been surrounded by bikes and tried to be surrounded by them as much as possible. And that's not changed anytime soon. So it definitely involve bikes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally then, what advice would you give to uh, a young, I was going to say young privateer, but it could just be any any privateer that's committed to um just as you did that's working all the time that's uh mm. training all the time struggling to balance or not really balancing <laughs> any of that <laughs> with with life <laughs> um what advice would you give to to young or just privateers racing racing seriously um yeah it's tricky one to, t- to think of just one answer there's like there's so totally, many yeah. layers. so many yeah yeah like there's so many layers to making it work and especially these days, because you've got those like social media and everything is such a huge part of being successful, whether whatever way you manage, you measure being successful. And, you know, I think it's you can be as good a racer as you as you want, but you, you pretty much can't get by without an Instagram account these days. Um, but, yeah, I'd say just, you know, just work hard, make the sacrifices, enjoy it, find the fun in it. Um, and, yeah, just get yourself to the races. Like, I think if you put yourself in a good position, you train well, you ride your bike well and you go to the races and get good results. Like people can't deny that, you know, you'll kind of, you'll make your own look basically like there's no, there's no silver spoon. There's no like free ticket to, to be in pro and just being at the races, getting the results and getting recognized and you, you know, you'll get what you deserve when, when the time comes. And imagine as well for you making that decision to, to get in touch with Chris Kamari at Point One Athletic was quite a, uh, or just getting a coach, you know, it, it was it was a good decision that you that you made. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would definitely recommend anyone to get a coach. Um, you know, there's a lot of good guys out there, and there's you know, coaching these days, it doesn't have to be fully regimented and fully like this scary training program that's going to make you hate riding your bike, or whatever. Like. There's definitely a lot of coaches out there that can see the fun side of it and the practical, real life side of training. So, uh, you know, if you are thinking of making a good go of it and you don't have a coach, I'd recommend reaching out to a coach and seeing what way you can, what's the best way to get the most out of yourself. Because um, at the end of the day, that that's what a coach is. It helps you get the most out of your potential. So, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much, Greg. It's been it's been really fun talking to you, um, and it's been really yeah, it's super. Uh, great having you on the on the podcast yeah no thanks for having me it's uh yeah good to come on and have a chat and uh cool to see what you guys are doing so happy to be a part of it all right thanks again no worries, thank you hello welcome to the outro uh crystal didn't fuck anything up this time so good job to crystal um and good job for me <laughs> Can you say fuck? i think so yeah Sure. Probably. Um, maybe we shouldn't, but we just did. So, Krista did a good job. I think I did a good job. Some great questions in there. I'm sure they agree. Um, and I think it was a good conversation. As I said at the beginning, if you agree that it was a good conversation, I would thoroughly recommend subscribing to our channel. It means as we release new videos, you will get them. It also means we're more likely to earn money. So if you want to support us in our endeavors to make more money, it would mean the world to us if you could subscribe to our channel. We're not even nearly at the money-making stage. That's why we're really drilling in this uh, subscribe thing. Of course, once we get there, we're probably going to want more money. uh, So we'll still want people to subscribe. Uh, But can you at least, let's just get us to the, get us to the start line in terms of the money-making. You know, I want some new pants. Trousers, American girlfriend. Uh, she talks about pants, so uh, she says she's unsubscribing. She won't. She's all talk. Anyway, thanks for listening, and thank you for tuning into this outro. Um, I could.
could go on. <laughs> There's not much more to say. You're still here. <laughs> You're the one watching this. <laughs> I could stay here all night. Oh, really? Oh, that's classic. It probably suits the effect. All right. Thank you.